Hey guys, welcome to Readout Productions. We're down here in Connorsville, Pennsylvania. It's November something or other, I don't know. Who cares? It's probably way later uh, than the date this video is recorded. So who cares about the date? What are we doing down here in Connorsville? Well, we're down here at the Okagany Riverfront Park. And we're right here at Colonel William Crawford's cabin. Well, not the actual cabin. That's a replica built by the Connorsville Historical Society back in the 1960s. We're also in a region called Stewart's Crossing, the first name for Connorsville, which is named for the river crossing, which we're standing at currently as well. All right, what was this all about? What are we gonna start rambling about? Well, Colonel C William Crawford was born in either 1722 or 1732. Sources are, uh, sources say both. Let's split the difference and say sometime in the late 1720s. He came from Virginia. Berkeley County, West Virginia today, in fact, and spent most of his earlier days as a farmer in Northern Virginia, which is now Western Pennsylvania. In 1742, we know that he married one Ann Stewart, who died a year later, shortly after giving birth to their first child. And in 1744, Crawford married again to Hannah Vance, who was from present day Fayette County, Pennsylvania, which is what we're standing in. Now, around the 1749, William Crawford came into the acquaintance of a young George Washington. Washington was out here surveying for Lord Fairfax, scouting out land prospects for the colony of Virginia. Crawford followed Washington up here in western Pennsylvania, and probably was the first time he ever saw this region of Stewart's Crossing, and he learned a lot of the tools of the trade of surveying from George Washington which Crawford used to do a side job as a surveyor up until about 1755 when a massive British army under command of Edward Braddock were making their way out of Virginia. Now, I've made other videos about Edward Braddock's doomed expedition to take Fort Duquesne in 1755, probably the most uh, second most famous action of the French and Indian War. Probably to say the most famous is Fort William, uh, the siege of Fort William Henry in the last Mohegans. Uh, Crawford was made a captain of a Virginia company on Braddock's expedition. Now, a key thing to remember about Braddock's expedition, the thing that got a lot of these Virginians to sign on and come out here to the middle of nowhere was the prospect of bounty land to settle after their service. Crawford, no doubt, was one of them wanting to get some land out here in western Pennsylvania. We know that on June 29th and June 30th, that Braddock's army made their 12 mile camp right here. They crossed over in this region of the Okagany. Why this region? Stewart's Crossing at the time, the river was only three feet deep and only about 200 yards wide. Uh, don't worry, those aren't, uh, uh, I don't hope those aren't cannons. <laughs> I hope those aren't cannons, they shouldn't have been fighting here. So roughly in this region, they made their crossing, camped on the other side. June 30th, they'd wake up. Dozens of bake ovens were on the other side of the river, baking bread. It'd be the last place they would get fresh bread before their disastrous battle along the banks of Monongahela on July 9th, 1755. Crawford survived the battle and would have came back through here with Washington and the shattered uh, British army on their retreat to, the, uh, Dun uh, to Dunbar's camp, which is several miles up the hill there. It's now the Jamonville Christian camp. Crawford stayed in the Virginia uh, infantry throughout the remainder of the war. As I mentioned, my apologies, he was an ensign on Braddock's expedition. Then he became a captain in 1758. And he took part as a, and he was a captain on Forbes' expedition, which instead of cutting up through Virginia held Pennsylvania, cut across Pennsylvania over the mountains, eventually ended up at Fort Ligonier where they planned to launch a siege on Fort Duquesne, but before they could, the French vacated Fort Duquesne, not wanting to take the chance of a suicidal defense against 5,000 British soldiers. Crawford continued until the end of the war. Uh, it says three more years he served, but it also says he served during Pontiac's Rebellion, which very, was very likely, so let's say 1763 his service went up. His service is up. He wants to claim his bounty land promised by Governor Dinwiddie and he is going to choose Stewart's Crossing. He's been here many times. He is much more familiar with Western Pennsylvania than his native Virginia. 
1765, he's gonna build a small cabin here. In the next year, in 1766, he'll move uh, Hannah and the rest of their children down here. Eventually, his uh, claims at Stewart's Cross are going to include 376 acres in the region. And really, this was the only settlement uh, here in this region. Uh, there was Christopher Gist Plantation back in the 1740s, but that had been burned prior to the Battle of Fort Necessity in 1754. So this was it on Braddock's Road, which was still now being used heavily by settlers who were illegally settling over here. Yeah, about that. So in 1763, to put an end to wars between the British colonists and the natives, King George III had drawn the proclamation line of 1763 following the Appalachian Mountains. It forbade settlement west of the mountains and made this region an Indian reservation. Most view this as a temporary boundary and we're going to take, uh, get themselves set up in perfect position to capitalize once that boundary was removed, which it was in 1768 with the Treaty of Fort Stanwix. Crawford's cabin, therefore, was the go-to place if you're coming up here to make land speculations. Everybody who was everybody traveling Braddock's Road would have stopped here. And would have almost always invited them in to discuss what they were doing out here, what lands they wanted to settle, all the while Hannah was most likely cooking them a warm meal and getting them ready for the rest of their journey. And eventually, in October of 1770, one of those visitors that would have greeted him on, his, on their quest for land speculation was George Washington. George spent a couple days here at the cabin before he and William took a journey down the Ohio River all the way to present-day Point Pleasant, West Virginia, scouting out lands that Washington planned to purchase. And by 1771, settlers around here are going to point William Crawford to be Justice of the Peace, initially of Cumberland County, Pennsylvania. Eventually, he'll be then appointed Justice of the Peace of Bedford County, Pennsylvania. And in 1773, we'll be appointed the Justice of the Peace of Westmoreland County. Essentially what was going on here was uh, they were keep, as they get better idea of what regions are out here, they get better defined boundaries. So the counties, they keep splitting off from the western end of the previous county. And in 1773, this was Westmore County, Pennsylvania. It's now Fayette County, Pennsylvania. Now this is where things get a little interesting. It's in 1774. The Cherokee have just sold the Virginia colony some land south down around the Tennessee region. Unfortunately, those lands were actually Shawnee lands. In response, Shawnee began to raid the front Virginia frontier. The Virginians start raiding native settlements. And eventually, the new governor, Lord, Din uh, Lord Dunmore, is going to call for soldiers to be raised at Fort Dunmore. What's Fort Dunmore? You probably are wondering well that's Fort Pitt the British Fort built down in Pittsburgh in 1763 yeah it's considered a Virginian Fort in 1774 oh dear here we go so here's the issues you've probably been guessing Pennsylvania claims Western Pennsylvania Virginia claims Western Pennsylvania and this is going to lead to almost a ma a civil war between these two colonies and William Crawford is caught right in the middle now, William Crawford is a Justice of the Peace of Pennsylvania. In fact, he's Westmore County's first ju uh, president judge. But he's also, at this point, hired by the Virginian Ohio Company to make surveys of lands that will be sold to Virginians. He is going to side with Virginia in this land dispute. And that gets him a lot of flack. Uh, ju uh, Pennsylvania Justice of the Peace, Arthur St. Clair, is actually going to call for the removal of Crawford from office, which eventually happens in 1776. There was no war between Virginia and Pennsylvania. Lord Dunmore's war uh, went out west, stuck primarily with the Virginians and the Shawnee, ended at the Battle of Point Pleasant, which I do have a video that you can watch on Construction Paper Battlefield. And most of it was forgotten about thanks to another war coming on the horizon, the American Revolution, which William Crawford had a big hand in play in. Crawford became a colonel and at first well, he was in a bunch of regiments. He was in the 7th Virginia Regiment, he was in the 13th Virginia Regiment, fought at all the battles such as Long Island, which, yeah, that's what he won on your record, Long Island, American, Long Island. Yeah. He had Long Island, he fought at Trenton, Princeton, and we know he also fought at Brandywine and Germantown. Now in 1778, 
He is sent back out here, out west, because he knows the terrain very well. And he is going to be tasked on helping out with multiple raids against native allied, uh, British allied Indians. Everybody forgets about this western feeder. There was a big western feeder out here, beginning around 1777. Multiple Native Americans were aligned by this point with the British. They were the lesser of two evils at this point. And they're going to start raiding uh, the Pennsylvania frontier. In response, Pennsylvanians and Virginians are going to start raiding Native settlements. You know, it's kind of a repeat of the French and Indian War. But things get very brutal. And in 1779, Crawford is going to aid in an attempt by the, uh, Brit uh, by the Americans to try to take Fort Detroit way out. That Detroit, Detroit, Michigan. Problem was, it wasn't wasn't well supplied. They only got far as Ohio at a place called Fort Lawrence, and they nearly starved there that winter. They were forced. It was so bad that they were forced to actually have moccasin stew, and that gave up any attempt by the Americans to uh, take Fort Detroit. Native raids continued in 1779, 1780, and 1781, and after so many years campaigning. The now middle-aged Crawford decided to, reti uh, decided to retire, but in 1782 is going to be enticed to come back on campaign to take charge of a raid on the uh, native village of Sandusky. Now, a couple months before this would go, a hundred Del uh, Christian Delawares were murdered at a. a missionary known as Guenhaud in Ohio. Over 100 were killed by Pennsylvanians. What this leads to is during the uh, campaign against Sandusky in 1782, William Crawford is going to be captured by the natives and is going in uh, revenge for that massacre, is going to be burned at the stake for over four hours. He's going to be scalped, he's going to have hot embers dumped over him. It is going to be a very, very terrible end for Crawford, who dies in June of 1782. Uh, before he left for the expedition, he seemed to have an already idea that he was not going to make it. And before he left and headed into Ohio, he actually wrote down his last will and testament, which divided up his Stuart Cross and estate amongst his wife and his children. Uh, I believe at the time he had four slaves in his possession. That's what is written down in his will. And those slaves would have been used predominantly to have cleared the 300 acres he owned here in present-day Connorsville. So, yeah, that's the story of William Crawford, a forgotten uh, American, gen uh, well, American officer. Wasn't a general, my apologies. Did a lot around here. Armor, surveyor, soldier, justice of the peace. Nearly caused a war between two colonies, but we'll ignore that. We'll ignore that. Crawford County in Pennsylvania is also named after. To visit the Rebelka Homestead, just turn off of 119 onto North 7th Street in downtown Connorsville, Pennsylvania. The park is traditionally home to an annual reenactment of Braddock's Crossing every June. We're not done talking about Crawford here in Readout Productions, but those videos will come at a later date. If you want to be the one, first one notified when those videos come out, be sure to subscribe here to Readout Productions. Thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.